Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Since earlier this week, we took the blessings of the Feast of Theophany. And today's reading has baptism as part of the theme. <clears throat> I thought today it would be nice to reflect on that event of baptism and repentance in general, and also about love, because it's all tied together. And so, if you'll bear with me as it relates to the gospel for today. The baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ is an important holy day, as we all know, uh, especially in the Orthodox Church. It's, it's called the Day of Theophany, which is roughly translated as the manifestation of God, the revealing of God, right? And St. John the Baptist, he lived in the wilderness and for a good portion of his life. And we're told that he ate locusts and honey and to survive. He preached and warned people about the Messiah, uh, and he was coming soon, and that it was time to repent, and it was time to get right with God. And one of the other important activities that St. John did was baptize. He baptized everyone that came to him, those who were repenting of their sins. And St. John provided a symbolic washing away of the sins of the past. So he must have been very surprised when his cousin comes to him, our Lord Jesus Christ, and asks him to be baptized, to be baptized by him. He knew that Jesus was holy, and so he must have been surprised when our Lord came to him asking him to be baptized. St. John the Baptist looked at our Lord and said, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. And St. John was a man of God. He was a prophet, but even he was no match for the goodness and the godliness of God, of Jesus Christ. And he was overwhelmed by the idea that he would baptize Christ, when it was really Christ who should be baptizing him. Jesus is the only sinless one. And he remains sinless, whether or not he received baptism or not. So then, what does it mean? What did it mean that, was it proper for our Lord Jesus Christ to do this because it was tradition of the Jewish people? No, not at all. The Jews did not have a tradition for baptism. So then, was Jesus doing this to be an example for us? Maybe, maybe. So then, what does it mean? What does it mean that, our Lord insisted on being baptized. I think the simplest answer to me is that our Lord forced St. John to baptize him in order to make baptism special for us, to sanctify it for us. Remember that the baptism of St. John was not really special in any way, if we really analyze it. It was merely a symbolic action. But the Christians, on the other hand, had never believed that baptism was symbolic. At least, they never believed that that was the case, you know, before the 16th or 15th century. If you don't believe me, read anything written by any Christian before the 15th and 16th century. It was not symbolic. And so, this is clear in many passages of the Bible even, in, including the book of Acts, chapter 22. When Ananias speaks to St. Paul saying, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins. So there's no symbolic baptism that could ever do such a thing. Symbolic baptisms may wash away dirt, but they can't wash away sin. And so our Lord Jesus Christ was baptized to sanctify baptism for us. And the Lord teaches us that he who believes and is baptized will be saved, as written in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16. So baptism becomes powerful. Because our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was baptized. And his baptism transformed the simple act of putting someone in water. And it, it completely transforms it. In fact, this act is so important that it's expected of everyone who believes in Christ must be baptized. It's that important. So baptism is not a mere symbol. It's full of power. Baptism washes away sins. Baptism is also death and a burial with Christ so that we can be raised with Christ. And baptism is putting on Christ. It's all these things. So when we're baptized, 
God the Father doesn't just see us. He sees our Lord Jesus Christ, his beloved son, through us, through each one of us. When our Lord was baptized, God the Father spoke from heaven and declared, This is my beloved son in whom I am well, whom I am well pleased. In our baptism, each one of us becomes his son or daughter. Each one of us becomes a child of God, royalty. Each one of us sees that God looks on us and is pleased with us. And it's up to us to strive to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. It's our choice to always be well-pleasing to God, just as we were on the day of baptism. So after Christ is baptized, the first words that he said was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because after we've been baptized, we're always tempted, and you know the only way to end temptation is to repent. And that's exactly, but what do these words mean? What is repentance? What is the kingdom of heaven? What does it mean to be at hand? In order to understand the meaning of the word repentance, we have to understand the nature of the opposite of repentance. That is sin. So sin comes in three stages. It comes as a thought, a temptation towards evil, if you will. And then second, if we entertain that thought and imagine its attraction until it becomes irresistible. And then third, we act on that thought. The thought that we've contemplated on, that we've entertained. These are the three stages of sin. Repentance also has three stages. First, our conscience is pricked. We have a thought that we have done something bad. Second, we entertain this consciousness, this thought, and develop it until action becomes irresistible. And then we act. Third, we act. These are the three stages of repentance. So repentance is, a, is not just an idea. It's not just a thought, but it's above all an action. Repentance is an action. Repentance is a change of mind, which leads to a practical and visible change in our way of life. It's true that oftentimes we may come to confession and we confess the same sins as before. And it's true that oftentimes we, we feel like we're making no progress, although, you know, We've done wrong again and again. Sometimes we lack tears. Sometimes we feel that we're tempted and there's no depth of repentance to make us feel like we're changing our way of life. But this should not mean that we lose hope or despair. That would mean that we would fall into another temptation, the thought that we're unable to repent and that all our efforts are futile. So coming to confession, saying that we are weak, saying that we have done wrong yet again, that our repentance lacks depth, this is an act of repentance in itself, being honest with yourself. And so by a continued repentance and a determination to repent, eventually the depth will come, the tears will come. Our Lord Jesus Christ offers the kingdom of heaven as a gift to those who turn to him with humility and love. Of course, sincerely turning to God implies doing many good deeds, good work, this unconditional love for all people that are around us, all people, not just a select group. <clears throat> good deeds and a life of unconditional love. It plays a central part in our journey towards God. But we have to be careful not to think that any good deeds earn us the kingdom of heaven. That's not the case. We have to be aware that we can spoil our good deeds, these deeds of love, with an arrogant and a self-righteous spirit. So we have to be careful. So when we talk about repentance, I want to emphasize the real, authentic repentance, it leads us to the, to the two greatest commands, right? In Matthew chapter 22, our Lord says, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great command. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. <coughs> if repentance is all about coming back to God and trying to be like God and to following his example, that means that we're ultimately needing to be more loving. If we want to repent, then what we need to ask ourselves are these simple questions. What more can I do to love my neighbor? What can I do to love my enemy? What can I do to show more love to God himself? How can I be more loving in general? And these are the questions that lead to change. These are the questions, these, these are questions that we ask ourselves that leads to true repentance. Sometimes we get caught up in the details in the Orthodox Church. Sometimes we get caught up on the fasting rules. Sometimes we need to check all the boxes off. Sometimes we get caught up with the complex theology. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's important. But those things are tools. They are things to aid our repentance. They are not an, an end in itself. Real repentance comes to asking ourselves, what does our love figure in all these things that we're doing in life? Repentance is about love. And Christianity is about love. We will be judged by whether or not we loved. Whether or not we clothed the naked and fed the hungry and visited the sick and imprisoned and cared for the orphans and widows. This is what we're going to be judged on. We have to ask ourselves, have we done these things? And even if we have, will we continue to do those things out of love? What is our true motivation? We are all lacking love to a certain extent. I know I'm speaking for myself. And that's why we have to continually repent. We, we all do things that can damage our relationships with each other whether it be our family members or our congregation members or people at work or at school and so on. And all of it boils down to this. Are we repenting of the things that separate us from God and from others? These two simple things. What are we doing about it? The things that are opposite of, of God, the things that are opposite of love, are hate and gossip and lies and judgment. Do we fall into these sins? All of those things tear our relationships apart. The church fathers and the scriptures and even Christ himself for that matter teach us that hatred and condemning others shut the gates of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of love. So the first condition of true repentance is reconciliation. It's reconciliation. That's where the work needs to be done. And we always need to be repenting so that we're ready to meet Christ at any moment. So to conclude, St. John, he bore witness to the light of Christ. And he was followed by countless witnesses. Those who witnessed for Christ by their words and their deeds. Many giving their lives for the sake of Christ. We, all of us, myself included, are called to be witnesses to that light. That's why we're Christian. To call yourself a Christian, but to fail to witness for Christ is a waste of time. Since the church was not founded on purposes of entertainment, it was not to preserve an ethnic culture. It was founded to teach each of us a particular way of life, a life in Christ to teach us and to guide us living in it. Therefore, we pray that we are mindful of what it truly means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ. And we pray that we can first prepare our lives for Christ to enter in, as Isaiah said, to make his path straight. This straightening up, this preparation for Christ 
to enter into our lives is what repentance and baptism is all about. Once we have straightened up, then we need to preserve our new life by growing in humility and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And glory be to God forever. Amen.